Okay, folks, I just want to... I'm very excited about this because I've not understood a lot of things in the New Testament, really, for many years. Uh, being a New Testament believer in Yeshua, in Jesus, uh, but not being Jewish or not understanding the Jewish context of uh, of the Scriptures, you know, when Jesus healed someone or raised the dead or, or um, you know, gave sight to the blind. I just thought, well, he's a very nice man, and he's God. That's nice. How wonderful. But... Uh, as time's gone on, I've realised that uh, there's very specific things Jesus never did, you know, that anything that's recorded about Jesus doing in the New Testament, in the Gospels, isn't just there as some nice pass away, th in, a, a nice thing to do, a nice bit of information. Uh, everything links together. Um, Jesus never did anything that wasn't extremely profound. <laughs> and uh, so when, it, uh, I just want to talk about the bit where Jesus is brought before um uh, the Sanhedrin and tested because to, to claim you're the Messiah, to claim that you're God, you've got to prove it. Anyone could stand up and say, I'm the Messiah, and lots of people did stand up and say that they were the Messiah back in them days. I mean, it's a bit like Life of Brian, you know. It, they'd do a test and find out if he was a Messiah, and they say, No, he's not, he's a very naughty boy. Uh, but Jesus, although they said he's a very naughty boy, he, he did prove to be the Messiah. And, uh, I just want to read the bit in Matthew 26 where um, he's brought before the high priest and he's actually commanded to say clearly whether he is the Messiah and to prove. He's done all these signs and wonders. They've tested everything. They've tested him uh, giving sight to the blind. Every every miracle he did had to be te had a process of three steps. Observation. Um, then they'd make it, they'd, so they'd observe it, test it, and then they'd have to come to a conclusion and say, well, whether it was it was real or is he the Messiah? And the specific signs he did uh, proved him he was the Messiah. Cause he had to do ones that Moses did. He had to prove, you know, heal a leper's leper's hand. Uh, he had to show uh, power over the serpent by casting out demons. He had to cast out demons out of a deaf and mute guy. Um, that was a sign he was Messiah. He had to heal. A, he had to raise the dead. You know, there's various different things. This is separate to his miracles, okay? So he's, he's kind of proved he's the Messiah by doing stuff. Because he says to them, which of these miracles do you, you know, you're doing me for? And they say, it's not the miracles, because they couldn't argue with the miracles. They actually just accused him of doing the miracles by the power of Satan himself, which is a very serious thing to do. Particularly when you're saying, wait a minute, this guy is the only person who's ever fulfilled the prophecies. But we know that, but we're going to just say he, he did it. He's possessed by a devil or something. He's evil. That was a real kind of low blow below the belt, that was. And uh, anyway, he's coming before the chief priests. He's been arrested. Very easy to arrest, by the way. He said, take me. Let them go. Let Andy Jennings go. Let the tax collector go. Let the prostitutes go. Let them blah, blah, blah. It's me you want. Jesus was so easy to arrest and so easy to crucify. He said, no one takes away my life, I give it freely. Might have looked like that, but it was all his plan. Fantastic, man. God, I love him. Love Jesus, man. <laughs> okay. So, okay, they came, he came, comes before the Sanhedrin. Uh, that's right. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. These men had brought false testimony against him, saying he was a drunkard, he was a liar, he'd, he'd preaching against Moses, he was, a, he was a heretic. But Jesus remained silent. He's brought all these accusations came against him, yet he remained silent. He was prepared to be found guilty of nothing and take the, take the rap, even though he'd done nothing. I love that, because I've done stuff, and if anyone accused me of stuff, I'd try and defend myself. But he had done nothing. And you'd think, well, if there's anyone who should defend himself, it should be Jesus. But he didn't. He said, that's nah, all right, I'll take it. Take it for Andy. Oh, good on you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Wow. Okay. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. That's a big thing. Are you the Messiah, the Son of God? Tell us plainly. He actually, you know, commands him. This is the high priest of Judaism. Under oath, Jesus says this. Yes, it is as you say. Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, 
In the future, you will see the Son of Man, Son of Man, important terminology, sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One, God, and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now, I was thinking, I've often read that and thought, hmm, okay, I don't quite understand, I don't understand that. I don't know what that means. What this is coming on the clouds of heaven, riding the clouds. Well, I've done a bit of digging over the years and come to realise that only Yahweh, God, rides the clouds. He is the only one who comes on the clouds. In the Old Testament, it was Baal, the pagan god, that was called the cloud rider. And God, Yahweh, comes along, the true God, the creator of the universe, says, no, I am the one who rides the clouds. It is I, the creator. So God is the one who rides the clouds. And there's various places in the Old Testament where he, says, he makes statements in Psalms and stuff that he is the one who rides the clouds. Yahweh rides the clouds. And uh, so Jesus is quoting straight out of Daniel chapter 7. And they know it. These guys are theologians. They know their Daniel, their prophecy. And Jesus is saying this. He's really giving it to them. So what, does, what happens there? Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look now, you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? So he's guilty of blasphemy. They knew what he was saying. When he said, he, I, you'll see me, him, the son of man, riding the clouds, he was basically he was saying, I am God, because only God rides the clouds. They knew that. Blasphemy is when you say, you are God. It's a terrible, you know, who is, who is God? Only God's God. This guy, Jesus, this rabbi, is saying, he is God. He's done these signs and wonders and miracles, proving that he's God and Messiah. But worse still, he claims that he is this person from Daniel chapter 7, which we'll read in a second. So they say, what do you think? He's committed blasphemy. He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spat in his face, struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, prophesy to us, Christ, who, who hit you? Hmm. Wow. Creator of the universe who stretched out the stars, the Pleiades, Orion's belt, the universe, galaxies, and right down to the very smallest particles that they're finding at CERN that make up an atom. The one who made all that and put that into place and holds it together is standing here being mocked, torn away, spat in the face. You know what? People saying God isn't a God of love, isn't humble. God's humble. Can you believe that? God, if I was God, I wouldn't be humble. I'd be going, I am God. That's because I'm a man, I'm a fallen man. And that's my idea of God. But God could do that, but his character won't let him. God's humble. It says that he became a man, humbled himself, became acquainted with a man of sorrows. Or... Oh, you see, Satan is proud. He wants to be God, worshipped by people, and he'll force them to do it. God's never forced anyone to worship him. It's always been an invitation. And to worship isn't really like a bow down and bow down and worship me. It, he knows that if we look upon him and have a relationship with him, he wants to be with us, he wants to fellowship with us. All through the Old Testament you see he wants a relationship with his people, with man. And you see a stubborn, stiff-necked nation. And I'm stubborn, stubborn stiff-necked. We're all stubborn and stiff-necked. Mankind is. Uh, but God well, uh, still desires to redeem us and to have us back. Prodigal son story, fantastic. There you go. But anyway, so Jesus takes it, and he takes it. He says, you will not see me again till you see me riding on the clouds, the Son of Man. Well, let's go to Daniel, chapter 7, verse 13. Daniel says, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, God, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him, this son of man. So someone in the likeness of a man comes before the throne of God, and it says all nations and peoples will worship him. Now, who, if there's only one God, 
Only he should be worshipped, no man surely. But this is not what we get from the scriptures. God is clearly three people, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and his dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Him, this Son of Man. So Jesus, again, let's just read it one more time. He says, Yes, it is as you say, but I say to you, all of you, in the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One, the Ancient of Days, and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus is saying, I'm that man, I'm the one of Daniel, I am God, come in the flesh, who all nations and peoples will acknowledge as God. What do they do? Then the high priest tore his clothes, woof, and he said, he's spoken blasphemy. They knew what he was saying. Anyone listening out there in cyber network land, Matrixville, Jesus has come into enemy territory, become a man, carne, incarnated, incarnation. He's become meat, he's become flesh. That happened, celebrated at Christmas or whatever, you know, that became a human being, like the Son of Man. And he has conquered sin and death on the cross. He went down into Tartarus and basically proved that he defeated the evil evil spirits of this world, Satan and his hordes, they had sought to get a foothold, and rose on the third day, appeared to many over the next 40 days, and then ascended to heaven, in this body, man like a son of man, and seated at the right hand of the, of the, the ancient days. Wow! How awesome is Yeshua, Jesus. Folks, he did that, not just to kind of say, oh, I'll do that, I'll turn that around, whatever, got some, got a job to do. He did it because he loved us. It's love. Who would do that? Many of us would do something, die for our friends. But who would do it for our enemies? Jesus did it for their enemies. Even as he hung on the cross, he said, forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. The stuff he went through. If you ever watch that film, Passion of the Cross, I can't bear, bear to watch it. It's a true depiction. It says that we could bear, he was barely human looking. Barely like a son of man by the time they'd finished whipping him. And it wasn't just the physical pain. That wasn't the physical pain that actually saved you and me. It was that he became guilty of all sin. All sin. That means someone like son of Sam who did those terrible, horrible things. Someone like that. You think, how could they be redeemed? How could Adolf Hitler be redeemed? How could it be possible that anyone that bad could be redeemed? Well, it's quite unlikely that someone like that would repent and believe, but it's possible because Jesus made it possible for the worst. Now, you out there, folks, if you're a believer, in, you know, if you believe that you've sinned and that you've done things wrong, right and wrong, you know, you know that you've done something, you've probably forgotten it, things you've done. If you know that, then you're qualified because Jesus said he came to pay the price for sinners. If you think you're a good person, perhaps you need to take another look and examine yourself against God's standards. Read the Ten Commandments. Or just read what Jesus expected on the Sermon on the Mount. Have you loved your neighbour? Have you done this? I've broken all those. I've failed. Absolute failure. All those things. Once you realise that, there's great news for you because Jesus loves you. He just wants a humble heart, someone who says it's a fair cop. You read, you read the New Testament and you see all these people that you think... Uh, how can they? Why did Jesus hang out with them? They, they, they were like, oh. well, he did it to prove that people who know they're like that are more likely to repent than the good people who supposedly think they're good. Of course, none of us are good. None of us are good enough. You may be. I know people who are really nice people, really good people, and they, but they, they think they're too good to be saved because they didn't, Jesus didn't need to die for them on the cross because they're kind of all right. Well, that's an illusion. That's not true. And all the same, Jesus proved that he was the Son. Uh, the man, the one that comes in the likeness of man, the son of man, uh, God who came as the son of man in the nature of hu a human being. And uh, I just think that's amazing. They th went to, you know, that's it. He was found guilty of blasphemy. Now, which which se segment of people do you belong to? Do you belong to them and say Jesus wasn't God? He's blasphemer, he's a troublemaker, you know, oh dear. Or do you accept that he is who he is? In which case... It's time to repent, believe in him, and accept him as Lord. Because he's coming again next time to set up his kingdom on earth. And he wants you in it. 
He loves you and he wants you to be reigning with him. He's going to share the future with you. No pain, no guilt, no sin. You see, if you turn to Jesus now, there'll be no guilt. He'll wipe away all your guilt because he paid for you. It's an amazingly liberating thing when you become a Christian. A lot of people think, well, I've got to change. Well, he changes you. Don't try and change yourself. That's religion. Don't read the self-help books. He will change you. He will give you the power. I can't change myself. I've tried to be a Christian and walk a Christian life. It's useless. It's just, it's, Jesus has to do it in the heart. But that's the wonderful thing about becoming a born-again Christian. He does it from inside. He gives you new desires. Over time, he makes you brand new and saves you. And uh, it's just a wonderful thing to be a Christian. God bless.